Chile is a beautiful and exotic country, known for its immense and diverse landscapes, extensive and historic culture, and world-renowned wine and beer, among numerous other reasons to visit. Chile's sheer number of vast, unique landscapes provide the country with an astounding amount of resources. In fact, mining said resources is a fundamental pillar of Chile's economy. For example, in 2019, Chile was the world's largest producer of copper, iodine, and rhenium. But mining is dangerous, and it's often the common folk who suffer injuries and deaths when things do go wrong. Since the year 2000, an average of 34 people have died every single year in mining accidents in Chile. And on August 5th, 2010, an especially horrifying incident would take place. At around 2 p.m. Chile Standard Time, the San Jose copper gold mine would collapse, trapping 33 miners more than 700 feet underground. For the next 69 days, these 33 men would fight off starvation, claustrophobia, and even thoughts of cannibalism without having any contact with the outside world for almost three weeks. The collapse would send so much dust into the little air they had that the miners would be blind for nearly six hours immediately after the mine had collapsed. As the men attempted to escape through the ventilation shafts, they were shocked to discover that the ladders required to be at the shafts by safety codes were missing. For nearly 17 days straight, they would have no contact with the outside world until a probe could be drilled down to them. Shockingly, all 33 men would survive, some with little to no injuries. So what contributed most to their survival? One man, Louis Urzua. Louis was the shift foreman on the day of the collapse, and ensured the safety of all of his men. Louis is credited by all men involved as being a fearless leader whose calm nature and gentle humor kept the miners focused on survival during their horrifying ordeal. Orzua immediately recognized the gravity of the situation, and gathered all of his men in a safe refuge before organizing the little resources they had to extend their survival as long as possible. He also created detailed maps of the cramped area he and his men were in, in order to assist the rescue effort. When rescuers would make their first audio contact with the trapped miners, Louis kept his cool and glossed over the hunger and despair he and his men had been feeling for weeks, stating, we're fine, just waiting for you to rescue us. And when the men were finally being rescued, Louis offered to be the last one out to ensure all of his men would make it to safety. It is indisputable that Louis's leadership was vital to the men's survival. Without expert leadership, all 33 men may not have made it out alive, which begs the question, what makes a good leader? A good leader is composed of many appealing attributes, such as the ability to maintain composure in high-stakes environments, being charismatic and well-liked by their team, and being able to make split-second decisions with no hesitation. Good and bad leaders surround us every day, whether it's at work or school, sports teams and other recreational activities, or even just at home within your family. There are always those who are willing and able to lead the masses. Because good leadership is so vital to our success as humanity, it is only natural that good leaders would be prevalent in the entertainment we consume on a day-to-day -day basis. That's why, in this video, I'm going to be taking a deep dive into a fictional leader who I think is extremely underrated and not discussed nearly enough. As you clicked on this video, I'm sure you already had an idea of who this video was going to be about. The unsung hero of Reach? For most people, only one name comes to mind. Noble Six. But this video isn't about Noble Six. It's not about Master Chief or even Buck, who actually was in Reach if you didn't know. This video is about a Spartan, a member of Noble Team, someone who isn't as unsung as the title may suggest, but who I think is extremely underrated and not appreciated nearly enough. That hero is Spartan Commander Carter A259. You see, something you may have noticed is that when it comes to Noble Team, there are different tiers of popularity. At the very top, we have Emil and Noble Six, who are mentioned pretty much every time Halo Reach is mentioned. Noble Six makes sense, as he is the main protagonist of the game, and Emil is, well, Emil, so he makes sense as well. Below them, we have George and Kat, who are usually mentioned because of the manner of their deaths, with Kat's death usually being ridiculed, and George's death being brought up because of how depressing it is. But at the bottom of this list, we have two characters who, in my experience at least, are hardly brought up, at least relative to how much the characters above them are brought up. June and Carter are both rarely brought up, and I am still confused as to why Carter is not as popular as the others. I mean, Noble Six is the main character, so he's obviously going to be popular. Emil is Emil, George is the older brother we never had, and Kat is an amazing driver, so it's obvious why those characters are more popular. June's character wasn't explored or fleshed out as much as the others, and him still being alive means that there is still potential for him to be explored more in depth, if 343 had any employees. But Carter is the selfless, composed, and lethal commander of Noble Team, and yet his popularity is not nearly as high as the others. That's why in this video, I'm going to try to convince you to appreciate Carter's character more. We'll begin with the little lore we have about Carter, which 
by the way, there should definitely be more books made about noble teams. It's criminal how little we know about their lives before the events of Reach. Carter was born in the city of Durban on the planet Biko on August 27, 2520. In 2526, when Carter was a mere six years old, Biko would become the first planet to become glass by the Covenant. As a result, Carter's parents would pass away, and the entire planet would be destroyed. Shockingly though, Carter would survive the glassing, and at 11 years old, he would be conscripted into the Spartan 3 program, making him one of the oldest Spartan 3s. He was conscripted into Alpha Company, which was the first company of Spartan 3s, and was composed of trainees that were four to six years old when the project began. Immediately, Carter stood out from the rest of his fellow trainees, and his commanding officers deemed him way too important to be sent on suicide missions like the rest of the Spartan 3s. As such, Carter would graduate in 2536, at 16 years old, and was immediately assigned to lead a special fire team of Spartans who also stood out. After an unknown period of time, the Special Forces Unit, Noble Team, was formed, and Carter would go on to become the leader of the team. He would lead the original Noble Team through a multitude of difficult missions. Unfortunately, Carter and Kat are the only remaining survivors of the original team, and both Carter and Kat blame themselves for the loss of their original teammates. On April 22nd, 2552, Carter led Noble Team to destroy a CCS-class battlecruiser that was maintaining position above Fumirole. Unfortunately though, this operation would result in the loss of Spartan Tom A293, the previous Noble 6, who has been referred to as Noble 7 to avoid confusion. This operation is also where Kat lost her right arm, leading to her using a prosthetic arm in the events of Halo Reach. Noble 7's death hit Carter and Kat hard, and both took responsibility over his death, even though it was Carter's decision that led to Noble 7's death. And that's literally all we know about Carter prior to the events of Reach. However, we don't need to know much about his past to determine what type of person he is. Halo Reach is a goldmine of evidence of who Carter is and why he is so underappreciated. From the very beginning, we get a peek into who Carter is. We start off with Carter speaking with Colonel Holland, and we see how cool and composed he is. This is a common theme for the rest of the game, as it's very hard to get Carter to lose his cool, even through all the hardships Noble Team would go on to face. Seconds later, Carter informs Six that he's stepping into some shoes the rest of the team would rather leave unfilled, signifying the impact that the previous Noble Six's death had on the entire team. Despite his team sentiment, however, Carter states that he is happy to have Noble back up to full strength, which further reaffirms his mission-first ideology, regardless of how he is feeling. At the Visegrad Relay, something that is easily missed when playing is that Carter immediately protects Kat from the incoming elite zealot, showing his selfless and noble personality. Furthermore, when that same zealot attacks Noble Six, Carter immediately jumps to protect Six as well, kicking the elite off of him and passing Six's gun to him. Right after this confrontation, Carter masterfully commands his team with no hesitation or uncertainty. That tango group asked me. Permission to pursue. Negative four, stay on the entrance. Two, handle her. Five and six, clear the hole. At Sword Base, Carter stands up for his team when interrogated by Halsey, remaining firm and unshaken with his statements. He does not fear Halsey and speaks confidently, recalling that he believed that he made the right decision. When Halsey threatens to send Kat to the brig, Carter immediately steps in and threatens Halsey, stating that she is interfering with a Spartan deployment. In just a few missions, we've already seen a massive amount of evidence pointing to the fact that Carter is the very definition of an ideal leader. He's selfless, confident, and does not hesitate to step in for his team. He shows a great amount of care for Noble Team and is well-liked and respected by his Spartans. Later, prior to the Long Night of Solace, Carter listens to Kat's plan, and despite having his doubts, respects and trusts her expertise enough to request Colonel Holland himself to let them proceed with the operation. It's clear that Noble Team is not a dictatorship led by Carter, and while they do abide by his rules, he is respectful and open to his team. Back on Reach following George's death, Carter personally meets up with Six and reassures him to make George proud. Immediately, we see the effects of George's death on Carter. His tone of voice is more monotone, and his body language, such as patting Six on the back, also reflects a sympathy towards the situation. Your report will have to wait, Lieutenant. The Covenant are jamming all comms to command. Cat needs your help running a counter-op. It's good to have you back. Sorry I came alone. Make him proud. Later, when the rest of the team gets together, Carter steps in after Emil's comment about George and says one of my favorite lines in the entire game. He gave his life thinking he'd just saved the planet. We should all be so lucky. It's never been more evident that Carter deeply cares for his team members, and George's death clearly impacted him hard. Unfortunately, 
hardly a mission later, Carter would have the misfortune of having to watch his lifelong teammate be sniped by a zealot. And not long after, he would have to carry Kat's lifeless body out of a shattered skyscraper. Another small detail that you may have missed is the way Carter speaks to Holland after Kat's death. Take a listen. Double one, go ahead. We need that base taken out, son. What's your status? Still outside. Thermal on the interior show standing room only. We're gonna have to send him out or we'll be way too popular. Copy that, Double one. Holland out. It's similar to the monotone voice he had after George's death, and he doesn't even respond at first. Although it's just speculation if that's because he was upset over Kat's death. It could entirely be possible that he didn't respond immediately because of other issues. But considering that nearly every time that Carter had to speak with Holland, Kat was the one patching him through, it's not too crazy to think speaking to him after her death would be breaking him on the inside. But no matter how he's feeling, Carter is a laser-focused commander who doesn't let his feelings ever get in the way of his mission. Seconds after talking to Holland, he's right back to ordering Six and his team and destroying Sword Base. After being redirected from the destruction of Sword Base to the transportation of Cortana, a lot of players miss another crucial detail. Carter orders June to escort Halsey, which seems like a noble endeavor, but says one line which changes the entire sentiment of the escort. Carter tells June to make sure nothing falls into enemy hands, essentially ordering June to off Halsey if she were to be captured. Unfortunately, Carter meets his demise protecting his team, like any proper leader should, as he crashes into a scarab to ensure Six and Emil survival. There is no sense of hesitation or fear in his final words. He has done his part, and now he must trust his team to do theirs. I hope I convinced you to appreciate Carter just a little bit more. He's often overlooked in favor of the cooler and more badass members of the team, but he's one of my personal favorite Spartans, and my favorite member of Noble Team. He's a laser-focused commander who had to watch most of his soldiers die before giving his life for whatever was left of his team. Even though Carter, and most of Noble Team to be fair, weren't as fleshed out as they could have been, I think they were written pretty damn well. The entire theme of Reach is this dire feeling of hopelessness. It gives you an existential crisis, and you don't need particularly well-written or fleshed out characters to achieve that. In fact, I think the fact that we know so little about Noble Team aids in the despondent and hopeless theme of this game. It evokes this feeling that Noble Team just isn't as important in the large scheme of things. It imposes this sense of unimportance on Noble Team, that they're just another group of soldiers in a meaningless war. It doesn't matter who they are or what they feel. They have a job to do, and that's what they did. But between the lines, there are glimpses into each Spartan's personality, and I think Carter's is easily overlooked. From how he shows so much care for each member of Noble Team, to his mission-first ideology, to his willingness to sacrifice everything for his team, he's the very definition of a good leader. Without his leadership, it's very likely that Noble Team would not have achieved the results that they did. Remember, a team is only as good as its leader, and Noble Team was lucky to have a damn good leader.